Welcome back friends and family, I'm Codiferous and today I'm bringing you Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, all mini bosses range from easiest to hardest. Because there are so many damn bosses in this game, I've broken the boss ranking for Sekiro into two videos. For this video, I'll be analyzing each mini boss battle in detail and providing strategies against them. In a separate video, I will have gone over all main story bosses, so if you're interested in hearing that, then feel free to check it out. Before we kick things off, we need to go over a few things. First and foremost, this list is made with the first time Sekiro player in mind. This means that I am accounting for the skill level of new players as they progress through the game, making note of their abilities, attack power, and prayer necklace count at each instance of each boss. Next, this list is entirely based on my personal opinion and is not meant to be taken as concrete fact. Each player's experience with this game is different, so it only makes sense that each of our opinions would also be different. Worth mentioning is that a few of the boss fights are repeated, so to avoid redundancy for this list, I will only be considering the most difficult iteration of each boss. I wanted to make note that in my playthrough of the game, I used zero candies, no dancing dragon mask upgrades, and I only used divine confetti on the apparition enemies. This means that I beat the vast majority of these bosses without any attack steroids outside of the memory attack boosts. With that in mind, I also want to add that each boss was encountered and defeated as early as reasonably possible, so there was no going off into the hyperbolic time chamber and then return nuking of a mini boss. Lastly, I tried my very hardest to avoid cheese strategies, but as you guys will see, I may have a little Swiss to sprinkle on this list. One final note, the only Japanese I know is from reading the backs of chopsticks, so if I butcher any of the following names, then you know why. Now we have a long ways to go, so without further delay, let's get started. Number 28, the Mist Noble. What a shock of a boss. The Mist Noble makes his appearance as a source of a mass illusion that takes place in the Ashina Depths. This Fallout centaur looking ass doesn't even bother putting his hands up to defend himself. He just offers his body up to the gods as a sacrifice. Just jump in there and slap him around like he owes you money. Short and sweet, if only every boss were like this. Number 27, Okami Leader Shizu. Upon reaching the Fountainhead Palace, it will soon happen upon a large lake that is begging for exploration. But if you try swimming out into the water, you can expect this to happen. You see that figure way out in the distance? That's our guy. After taking the scenic tour of the palace, you'll find your way over to Shizu whom you'll discover that for all that damage and annoyance, she's a huge pushover. Close the space and avoid falling off into the water, because if you do, you will certainly die. As you rush her, be prepared to cast a reversal if she chooses the lightning route. As soon as you get up in her face though, this boss is done for. Boasting only one health bar, she staggers against all of your attacks. Give her the old whack twat in a knapsack and call it a day. Number 26, Leader Shijinori Yamachi. Yes, we will be including the prologue boss in this list. Shijinori boasts an incredibly simplistic attack structure with large, exaggerated swings that give you a window of approximately 1.3 months to block against. Even if he breaks your posture, he has such a large delay in his attacks that you should have ample time to recover yourself before sustaining any real damage. Seeing as how you've only fought a small handful of enemies at this point, there isn't any super advanced strategy to apply yet. Shijinori has super armor on all of his attacks, so the only time that you should be getting hurt by him is if you're playing like a greedy fuck and not waiting for your turn. What I'm saying is you need to play this fight like Pokemon, and wait for him to attack before making an attack of your own. Just play things patiently and get a feel for how the combat system works. He only requires around 6 or 7 hits to break his posture where you can then perform the death blow. A strong tactic to employ for new players who haven't grasped the deflection mechanics quite yet is to perform a thrust attack at range before dodging back. Seeing as how he's the first boss of the game, you shouldn't struggle against him too much. Number 25, General Naomori Kawarada. Naomori Kawarada will pose a threat to new players if you face him head on. He's a bit of an upgrade from Shijinori in the sense of move diversity and frequency of attacks. His most common perilous attack will take shape as a short range sweep that you can counter via jump kick. This attack will only be a threat if you get careless or greedy. I recommend taking to the high ground for a stealth blow to cut this fight's runtime in half. When his posture gets high, he will attempt to recover it. You'll know he's going to do this because he'll start gathering his key to prepare for his battle against Frieza. 
A single hit or shuriken toss will interrupt this channel. Sekiro is all about deflection and counterattacking. The sooner you master this mechanic, the easier the game is going to be. But for this boss, soul style combat of attacking and dodging will suffice. Make usage of thrust attacks between each dash to get some free poke damage on him. His responses are slow and his attacks are largely telegraphed, so as long as you time your intervals correctly, you should leave this fight relatively unharmed. Number 24, Longarm Centipede Senun. Longarm Centipede Senun is found in Senpu Valley surrounded by his underlings. These enemies have very low perception and can be death blowed by jumping at them and then attacking. Senun himself can be stealth blowed from the rafters above. For this fight, it may be worth it to kill off all of his minions first as they have an incredibly annoying fire attack. I was just saying that Sekiro is all about deflection and against this boss there's almost no other way to beat him. He has two main attacks. The first is a long combo where he strikes several times with his patent protected wolverine claws. The deflection window for each swing is generous, so literally spamming the block button will reward you with a deflection on almost every attack, which makes you feel like a total badass. You'll know that you've deflected an attack successfully when gold sparks fly out from each point of contact. At the very end of his combo, he will almost always do a perilous sweep attack that you can see coming from a mile away. Jump kick at the appropriate time to get some free posture damage. After this, he will start his rotation all over again with the Wolverine combo. Rinse and repeat, and his prayer bead is yours. Number 23, Longarm Centipede Giraffe. It should be no surprise that Giraffe follows directly after Senun. The reason why Giraffe gets a higher placement is because he's more unexpected, has a smaller arena, and is harder to get a stealth death blow on. He has the same attacks as Sinun and follows the exact same attack patterns. For this fight, you're going to have to repeat the same strategy that you did for Sinun, but through two health bars instead of one. No new twists or gimmicks to be mentioned here. Just blast his ass cheeks and take what's yours. Number 22, Ashina Elite Jinsuke Seiz. Staying with the theme of deflection based strategies, Jinsuke is a little harder to pin down than the long arm centipedes. Found near the top of Ashina Castle in the dojo, Jinsuke has a few attacks in his move pool, but he really only sticks to one, and that's the Ashina Cross. For this attack, he'll lower his stance and his sword will glint before suddenly rushing at you and striking you twice in quick succession. Each of these swings deals piercing damage, so you must perfect block to avoid taking damage at all. Furthermore, for each attack that you perfect block, you will deal significant posture damage to Jinsuke. Do not focus on attacking him at all. He often performs the Ashina cross back to back and he gets armor on this attack. This means that he will always power through your offense and getting hit by a full Ashina cross will almost one shot you at this stage of the game. Since he cannot be stealth blowed, you will have to go through both health bars in the traditional way. You can expect to die a few times here as you try to learn the timing of the deflections, but as soon as you learn it, Jinsuke will prove to be barely an inconvenience for you. Number 21, Ashina Elite, Ujinari Mizuo. Ujinari is an exact reflection of your fight with Jinsuke. The caveat here is that his damage and aggression is cranked through the roof. I had 9 prayer necklaces at this point of the game, and he was still able to two-shot me. Ujinari is a red-eyed enemy, which would typically mean that he has a weakness to the flame vent prosthetic. This is a lie. This is meant to mislead you. Do not try to use fire against him. The flame barrel has a large wind-up time, and in that time, Ujinari will be busting those cheeks like water balloons. Just stick to the same strategies you do with Jinsuke. Time your deflections against his Ashina cross, and like before, his posture will shatter in no time. To make things easier, unlike Jinsuke, you are actually able to stealth blow Ujinari. Simply aggro him and then run away. When he resets, he will walk back to the suit of armor, in which time you can sneak behind him to give him the slip. Although Ujinari is encountered at the very end of the game, he finds himself so low on this list because most players have a strong grasp on deflections at this point, which happens to be his greatest weakness. Number 20, General Kuronasuke Matsumoto. Matsumoto is another samurai general enemy type and as such he boasts the same loadout as Kawarada. 
Found just outside the door to Ashina Castle at the top of the castle steps, Matsumoto differs from the previous Samurai General in that he has increased damage, resistances, and is accompanied by four gunmen. You're going to want to open up this fight by dispatching all the gunmen first, because while they are frail, their shots are surprisingly accurate and deal a moderate amount of damage. After this, retreat to the rooftops to lose aggro from Matsumoto. This allows you to get a free stealth death blow. From this point, you're going to want to be on the low ground. Contrary to what Obi-Wan has to say about it, the seat of power in this game is always having the low ground. Not only does it add plus 5 to your agility, but it also allows you to hit enemies in the feet while their attacks are more prone to going over your head altogether. The dangerous attack here again is the dramatic sweep which you can either jump kick or dodge backwards to avoid. While easy to see coming, getting hit by this move will almost one shot if you're not at full health. He has another imposing attack in the form of a jumping slam that your instincts will scream at you to run. But something that you have to remember is that if an attack is not accompanied by the danger kanji, then it can in fact be blocked. Deflecting this move will give you a window to get some damage in on him. Like Naomori Kamarada, this boss can also gather his key to regenerate his posture. Interrupt this with a well-timed strike or shuriken toss. If things go south against this boss, you can always retreat back to the sculptor's idol at the bottom of the stairs to refresh and start things over without dying and losing half your experience and money. Number 19, General Tenzen Yamachi. Yet another samurai mini-boss, Tenzen is located in the area just after beating the chained ogre. Like Matsumoto, Tenzen is surrounded by a slew of b-boys. I suggest going out the hole in the building and to the right to first kill the alarm soldier before getting into killing the others. Ideally, you'll have Tenzen Yamachi all on his lonesome before going in to get your free stealth death blow. After that, it's the same old patterns that are becoming of a samurai mini-boss. If you can help it, try to get to the low ground and use the agility bonus to cut away at his feet. If you die or rest at Nidal, all of the b-boys will come back, so you have to again run the motions of killing them. His damage doesn't seem to be much higher than Kawarada's, so you should have an easy enough time with this one. Again, thrust attacks and dodges will lend a big hand in this fight. As with the others, Yamachi can regenerate his posture via channeling his key. A solid sword swing or shuriken toss will interrupt this and allow you to keep the pressure on his posture gauge. Each of the samurai mini-bosses find themselves in the lower parts of this list because they are a variation of an introductory boss with little differentiation between one another. Being slow, interruptible, and having large telegraphed attacks, the samurai generals stand little chance against getting folded by the casual passive-aggressive player. Number 18, Sakura Bull of the Palace. One of the most random bosses in the game, the Sakura Bull is a reiteration of your fight with the Blazing Bull. While devastating in its attacks, the Sakura Bull does nothing to stop your own. It will charge around the arena and try to mow you over. You'll know that you'll have to block because just before it attacks you, the bull will lower its head all the way to the ground first. The attack that caught me off guard the most was its thrash attack. Each of the bull's attacks can be blocked, but if they are not perfect blocked, aka deflected, then you will sustain piercing damage. Your best friend for this fight will be the shinobi firecrackers that are obtained from the Battlefield Memorial Mob for 500 sen. The firecrackers will put the Sakura Bull into a frightened animation where you can then follow up for free damage. Don't spam the firecrackers however, because there is a cooldown period for its effectiveness against the bull. When it gets low on health, it will rampage around for a bit. This means that you have essentially beat it. Wait out his tantrum and then slide in for the execution. Number 17, Blazing Bull. It only follows that the Blazing Bull would be our next point of conversation, seeing as how it follows the exact same pattern of attacks as the Sakura Bull, but with a bit of an added threat. As its name would imply, the Blazing Bull will stack up the burn status with each of its attacks. Also, you may be like me and not have the Shinobi Firecrackers at this point in the game. Your best bet is to dodge its charges and then punish it with just a few hits before it turns around. Its thrash attack has a very solid chance of one-shotting you this early in the game, so you don't want to stick around its face for too long. Again, when the bull charges you, it will lower its head before unleashing an attack, so parry accordingly. Up to this point, you haven't battled a boss like this, so don't feel down if you die a few times while learning its behavior. Just like the Sakura Bull, when the Blazing Bull gets low, it will throw a tantrum before downing itself, where you can then go in for the execute. The Blazing Bull and Sakura Bull of the Palace find themselves in the lower portion of this list because they have no defensive values, a large weakness to firecrackers, and only a single health bar to boot.
Number 16, Lone Shadow Long Swordsman. The Lone Shadow Long Swordsman is found in the Ashina Reservoir from where you first start the game. The Long Swordsman is a Ministry Agent in boss form, meaning that he boasts all of the attacks and abilities of your typical asshat. No matter how you cut it, this boss fight's gonna be tough. Up to this point, you may or may not have even battled a Ministry Agent, depending if you bothered to get the Mystery of a Prosthetic from the Lady Butterfly memory. With that accounted for, you will have no experience against the Long Swordsman. Furthermore, the arena you fight him in is tiny, which means the camera angles are going to be all sorts of cluck fucked. His attacks are fast, as are his movements, which really sets him apart from all previous mini bosses. He has two variations of sword combos, which will make up the majority of his offense. While the camera will be trying to whack off into your Coco Macchiato, as long as you see his startup, you should be able to account for the parry timing. When he brings his sword out to the left, he will do a quick 2 slash combo. If he brings his sword out to the right, he will do a 3 slash combo instead. He has two unstoppables that you need to be mindful of. The first is a sweeping kick that he will always perform after doing the dramatic flying drop kick. It's easy to see when he does this sweep because he will scramble on the floor like his legs are possessed before charging at you. Jump kick him when he does this for free posture damage. He may also try to weave his perilous sweep in with other attacks, so be on the lookout for that. The next perilous attack comes in after he performs a large series of kicks. Try your damnedest to deflect these as it will shatter your posture if you simply block them. At the end of his kick combo, he will do an unstoppable in the form of a charging kick. It took me a long while to figure out, but this charging kick can actually be Makiri countered, so make usage of that. The good news for this boss is that he can be stealth blowed from a convenient hole directly above him. This effectively halves the difficulty of the fight. There are two ways to fight this, honorably and dishonorably. To bring blessings upon your family lineage, try to stay in the center of the square portion of the well. This is the approach you're going to want to take in a head-to-head -head bout. To bring shame to your descendants and disrespect upon your cow, take the Codiferous patented low ground advantage. Bait him into jumping onto the upper platform of the well before pulling the old switcheroo and taking to the low ground. This puts him in perfect range for some whirlwind slashes and keeps you safe from most of his arsenal. The attacks you need to be on the lookout for is his flying dropkick and his rushing sword slash as the hitboxes for these attacks can still connect with you. Even so, fighting from the low ground isn't 100% lactose approved so take it as you will. Number 15, Lone Shadow Valhand. Lone Shadow Valhand is found on your second trip to Ashina Castle in the same room where you battle Jinsuke Seiz. If you roll a bad perception check and rush into the room, you will most certainly die. Valhand is an upgraded version of the Ministry Agent and he cannot be stealth blowed like the Long Swordsman can. In addition to this, he has a Ministry Agent chilling in the corner that will partake in the gangbang. If you choose to fight the two of them head on, then I have to say, while I am not a doctor in any sense of the word, I think my word would hold some credibility in diagnosing you as clinically insane. The strategy for this fight lies in the Ministry Agent. Sneak into the room and stealth kill the agent in the corner. Using your newly acquired puppeteer ninjutsu, you can turn the tables and make this boss fight a 2v1 in your favor. While you still have to chew through two health bars, Valhand will prove to be a much easier fight thanks to your unlikely ally. As for Valhand himself, he boasts the same attacks and behavior as Lone Shadow Longswordsman, but he has an added twist. He specializes in poison-based attacks that stack up poison through your guard. His poison attack comes in the form of a 3-hit combo that has a clear sign of the startup. He will raise his hand above his head like he's casting the hidden Miss Jutsu, and his hand will become wrapped in a harsh green light. You can usually block up to two of these attacks without any harm, but blocking the entire combo will afflict you with a long-lasting poison dot. Other than that, he has the same sword combos and perilous attacks as before. Makiri counter his charging kick, and jump kick his sweep. Do not rush this boss, as with all Ministry Agents he is adept at punishing sloppiness. Also make certain to maximize the usage of your puppet and push for a strong offense while he's there to distract Vilehand. After your puppet expires, that's when you can take a more reserved approach. Number 14, The Armored Warrior. The Armored Warrior was a very tough boss for me to place on this list. Knowing what I know now, I feel like he should be lower, but knowing what I knew at the time, I initially had no idea how to beat this guy. While he is slow and doesn't recover any posture, the Armored Warrior has extreme range and deals buku amounts of damage. He also has super armor on all of his attacks, so there's no counting on staggers to undermine his offense. The battle is won through posture alone. For a clean victory, this means that you need to counter all of his perilous attacks and deflect all of his basic swings. He has a generous telegraph on his thrust attack which you can easily Mickey counter. His most dangerous attack is Robert's Vengeance where he slams his sword wildly in front of him. Each swing deals heavy posture damage even if deflected so to avoid a spanking your timing on your blocks needs to be perfect. 
When his posture breaks, Sekiro will deal a death blow where he crawls up on him and then kicks off. Now if you did this wrong, the armored warrior will stand back up and taunt you before getting back to swinging. What you're supposed to do is angle yourself so that you kick him off of the edge after breaking his posture. I died several times here before I accidentally got it. Like I said, the armored warrior is one of the tougher placements for me to make. Having prior knowledge of him would definitely put him lower on this list, but going in blind like I did earns him the spot. Number 13, Tokushiro the Glutton. Seemingly a little out of place, Tokushiro is found chilling in the Most Noble's Illusion with a group of monkeys. Start this fight off as you would with any mini boss. Kill off his adds and then hit him with that stealth blow. Tokushiro is an exact recreation of Juzo the Drunkard, albeit with a damage upgrade. Tokushiro boasts the same poison basis, grapple, swordplay, and open windows as his sumo warrior brethren. But even with that similarity, he still hits like a truck, dealing 80% vitality per swing. Even if perfect blocked, he still stacks a lot on your posture bar as well. Like all sumo warrior bosses, agility is his weakness. The Mist Raven Shinobi prosthetic will prove to be your best friend against this adversary. Tokujiro is allergic to blocking, so chopping your way through his openings is the best way to go about this. The Whirlwind Slash Comet Art is a solid choice to employ if you take the hit and run approach in fighting him. Keep an eye on your posture bar for this fight, and for the love of ass, dodge his grapple attack. His damage is pretty insane, so keep your health topped off and use your healing items generously. Even if you think your health is good, if it's anything less than full, you still risk being one shot. Number 12, Shinobi Hunter, Ancient of Maisen. Found in Lady Butterfly's version of the Hirata Estates, the Shinobi Hunter earns a high spot on this list simply for being your first mandatory encounter with a Spear Wielder. If you don't have the Makiri counter, I suggest simply leaving this area and then grinding until you can get it. Once you have the Makiri counter, do the usual and kill his ads before stealth blowing him. Now the real fight can begin. He employs a large range of thrust attacks which can all be Makiri countered for large posture damage. This is much easier said than done if I'm speaking to the new player, but trust me, it's better than trying to go swing for swing against him. His damage is insane for this early in the game, and being the first of his kind, new players are going to have a crying time against him. Keep your distance and watch for the telegraph of his thrusting attacks. Upon a successful counter, you are free to get in a shot or two before he pushes you off of him. Admittedly, I put the Shinobi Hunter this high based on the experience of a friend of mine, as well as comparing him against the other spear-wielding enemies encountered in the memory. This is because, when I went to fight him, his AI bugged out and he ended up surrendering to me. In addition to the Armored Warrior, this was a very difficult boss for me to rank, but the reason is because I didn't really get a fair fight against him. Number 11, Oren of the Water. Such a memorable boss, Oren of the Water provides a unique battle in the form of an onslaught of guerrilla warfare. Trying to press the offense on this unstable lady will bring you pain and punishment like never before. Oren floats across the battlefield taking dives and slash combos. Between each bout she will turn ethereal and float away, in which instance you won't be able to damage her. Your best bet is to wait for her to come to you. Perfect to flight her combo and wait for her ending unstoppable sweep. Jump kick her here for significant posture damage. Oren is technically an apparition enemy, but because of the nature of this fight you won't be doing much vitality damage to her. For this reason, save your divine confetti and focus on keeping her interested so her posture doesn't regenerate too much. Occasionally Oren will do a perilous attack where she slowly walks at you. I never got hit by it, but I'm willing to bet it's not a platonic kiss in the cheek. Stay on the defensive for this fight and be patient. Oren punishes sloppy offense more than most bosses and you don't want your time investment to go to waste. As a side note, Oren ranks up there with the Armored Warrior as my favorite mini-boss because of the wholesome uniqueness of their respective encounters. Number 10, Snake Eyes Shirahagi. The Snake Eyes are difficult enemies as a standalone. As you can imagine, the boss variant is much more than that. Shirahagi is encountered at the Poison Pool on your way through Ashina Depths. This arena is filled with gunmen and cannoneers that have incredible sight but poor hearing. This means that as long as you stay out of their line of sight, you should be able to get stealth kills on most of the ads. But screw all that! What you're going to do is Spider-Man your ass all the way over to the Fallen Statue and get the freest death blow of your damn life. Now the fun begins. Snake Eyes Shirahagi is much tougher than she looks, and yes, I said she. 
In a note that you find earlier in the game, it says that the snake eyes are all female. Boom. Trivia. Anyways. Her attacks hit for over 50% and she gets a generous amount of super armor. The tricky part of this boss is twofold. Unlike previous melee bosses, healing is not safe against Shirahagi. If you back away to heal up, she will always resort to her gunshots to punish reckless guzzling of the healing gourd. The other tricky part of this fight is her grapple attack. While this grapple can be parried at the correct moment, it boasts super armor, has the strangest delay, and has a deceiving amount of range. The good news is that successfully dodging the attack gives you a solid window to get some punishment in. Shirahagi's attacks are not problematic in themselves, it's the amount of posture and vitality damage that they inflict. For being a lady with a large rusty cannon, she hits like a tank. For this fight, I suggest doing quick slashes and ducking back from her melee attacks. You're welcome to parry, but be mindful of your posture buildup. Her basic ranged shots have a dramatic telegraph, so a well-timed dodge will let you cut into her defense. If you don't dodge, then at the very least block. There's a chance of her gunshots breaking your posture, but if it happens at range, you'll be in no danger at all and have time to reset your posture, seeing as how she has a generous cooldown to attack after firing her weapon. Shirahagi's most annoying basic attack is a revenge value that she employs when she's pressured too much. It's a short back dash followed by a quick shot from the cannon. This attack comes out faster than her other attacks and always caught me off guard in my experience. As soon as you see her back dash, get that block up. Essentially, you're going to want to avoid doing stand and deliver against her melee onslaught. This boss deals significant posture damage and let me tell you, you really don't want to have your posture broken at melee range. If you're looking for a long con cheese, one of my colleagues discovered that you can lure Shirahagi into the poison pool and wait 23 years for her to melt. You're welcome to employ the strat, but congrats on your tainted victory. Number 9, Juzuo the Drunkard, first fight. If you got the Father's Belly Charm, then Juzo the Drunkard is encountered two times throughout the game. For this ranking, I chose to put his first iteration on this list, as I believed it to be more challenging. This is because the second time you fight Juzuo, you should have a bit of experience with fighting sumo warriors such as Tokushiro the Glutton. Also, when you fight Juzuo's second iteration, you have a large variety of shinobi tools that you can use to abuse his slow reaction times. Now, the first time you fight Juzuo at the Harada Estates via the Young Lord's Belly Charm, he has a mass of groupies accompanying him. You also may have been like me and entered the Harada Estates as soon as you were able to. As in, before the Chained Ogre fight. At this stage of the game, with no prayer necklaces or damage upgrades, Juzuo is a monster. His attacks deal nearly 80% of your total health and he has super armor on all of them. He specializes in poison, which he can utilize to either imbue his weapon or to blow the fattest of feudal vape clouds. His most dangerous attack is his grapple. For this, he will reach out at you and perform a classic sumo stomp. The attack has a large windup, but carelessness will see you getting one shot by it. From Software knew that this was going to be a challenging fight, seeing as how they actually give you help in the form of a samurai battle buddy. However, seeing as how there are archers and shield boys scattered about the arena, your buddy isn't going to amount to much amidst this cuckfuckery. So here's the strat. First, you're going to want to sneak around the left and pick off some of the soldiers. Make certain to stealth bolt the shield boy here. You're going to end up alerting the entire encampment, but you can sneak off to the side and get to work on thinning the numbers. Juzuo has low perception and loses interest in you easily, so use that to your advantage. While you're doing this, I have to stress how key it is to not bring any of the soldiers near your battle buddy or you'll aggro him. We want to save our battle buddy for the final hour. As soon as you're comfortable, you can now sneak up behind Juzuo to get a stealth death blow, in which case you now need to book it back to the samurai battle buddy and have him join the fight. In a wild turn of events, it is now 2 vs 1. Try to get Juzuo to focus on your battle buddy and have at it from behind. Between the two of you, you shouldn't have much of a difficult time taking the big man down. Juzuo is most vulnerable when he goes for his poison attacks, which is signaled by him taking a large swig from his wine skin. Get a few hits in and be ready to dodge the poison cloud. If he chooses to breathe liquid courage on his weapon, take the opportunity to get a few more thwacks at his ass cheeks. For Juzuo's second fight, abuse the Mist Raven to punish his lumbering movements. Your skills at this level of the game should take care of the rest. Number 8, the Shishimin Warrior. Throughout the game you will encounter the Shishimin Warrior three times. For this list, I chose the Shishimin Warrior located at the Fountainhead Palace. Each warrior boasts the exact same moveset as one another, with the only difference between them being their arenas and the scaling of their damage and resistances. Even though this is the last of the three Shishimin Warriors, he proves to be the most difficult because of a little something that I like to call the bullshit factors. While each warrior has two BSFs by default, this particular one has five. 
Firstly, the Shishiman Warrior is classified as an apparition type enemy, so we can only truly be battled through the usage of Divine Confetti, a rare and expensive item. This makes the boss annoying because for each death, the game does not restore your resources, meaning that each use of the confetti has to count. In addition to this, with each attack, the Shishiman Warrior applies a status called Terror. If the status bar fills up, you will instantly be killed. To remedy this, I suggest getting the mottled purple gourd from the Exile Memorial mob at Mibu Village, sold for 1800 sen. The next three BSFs come from this specific fight. The arena that you fight this boss in is a narrow river. This becomes a problem because he will periodically teleport from one end of the river to the next and then execute his death beam. This beam will apply nigh instant terror and it penetrates through surfaces. Because of the narrow arena, dodging this attack will prove to be a challenge. If you have the Phoenix's Lilac Umbrella, then using it will completely shield you from this attack. Unfortunately, I didn't have this luxury. The last two BSFs come from random ads that can be aggroed to add the Dingleberry to the top of your shit Sunday. At the end of the river near the waterfall, there's a high chance of you being attacked by two Thunder Pups. When you're fighting at this location, be very mindful of your positioning because you don't want to draw their attention, and you definitely don't want to be knocked off the waterfall. There's no easy way back up, and if you haven't beaten her yet, Shizu will shock the shingles out of your sphincter. At the other end of the river, if you jump around too much, you risk attracting the attention of an Okami Naginata. You know, the kind that use lightning. In my experience with this fight, I got so caught up fighting off the adds that when the Shishman warrior teleported away, he lost aggro on me and regained all of his health back. I can only pray that you don't have the same shitty look as I did. For this battle, you're going to want to stick to him with your Divine Confetti active at all times. His most dangerous move is his Death Beam, which can be avoided if you strafe at a slight angle. He also has variations of Terror Balls that he will send at you to inflict chip damage and stack Terror. Dodge the balls as best as you can and stick with a simple note of, the bigger the balls, the bigger the threat. Luckily, smacking the Shishman Warrior with the Divine Confetti active will interrupt most of his channel attacks. When he fades away, back up and immediately start running for the other side of the river. With any luck, you'll be in close enough proximity to circle him and dodge the death beam. Beat the spook out of him until he teleports away, and then make your way back to the other side of the river. If you have the anti or death blow skill, then this boss becomes trivial. When he does a slow motion jumping attack, you can instantly pop one of his health bars by jumping and hitting the attack button. Keep in mind though, that you need the divine confetti active to perform this trick. Unfortunately for me, I didn't have the anti air death blow going into this fight. Number 7, Chained Ogre. <sighs> Do I even need to talk about this guy? Hmm, I didn't think so. Alright, fine, let's get this over with. When you first meet the Chained Ogre, he's caught up in the stocks, seemingly defenseless. As you start beating away at his face, he'll get all the motivation he needs to promptly break out of his shackles. I hope you prepared your Angus for this fight, because little did you know, the Chained Ogre is a huge fan of the Undertaker. This bad boy specializes in grapples and ass whoopings. With wonky ass hitboxes and obscene amounts of damage, it should be considered cruel and unusual punishment to hit the early game with a boss like this. The Chained Ogre has super armor on all of his attacks and any two of his moves is enough to kill you from full HP. Taking a note from Ninja Gaiden, the Chained Ogre abuses grapple attacks for a minimum of 80% of your health. And if you're unlucky enough, there's a decent chance that he banishes your scrub ass to the Shadow Realm altogether. To beat the Chained Ogre, you're going to have to learn the strange timing to his delayed grapples, as well as the fast startups to his both barrel drop kick and his sweeping kicks. Blocking is not a dependable strat, seeing as how he deals significant posture damage mixed in with his unblockables. Hit and run tactics seem to work decently enough, as well as throwing in some frame perfect dodges. As with all bosses, the Ogre does have a weakness to a specific shinobi tool. In his case, it's the Flame Vent. You discover this bit of information from eavesdropping on the two soldiers posted just in front of the Chained Ogre. This means that if you explore the Harada Estates and acquire the Flame Barrel, then you'll have a much easier time with this boss. When set ablaze, the Chained Ogre will take steady vitality damage in addition to being stunned for a generous period. During that time, you can get in several free shots. The Flame Vent has a dramatic wind-up before being cast, so don't blatantly walk up to the Chained Ogre and expect him to just take it. The best time to set him ablaze is after he misses a flying kick or a grapple. This boss is a major hurdle for most players, so try not to feel too bad for spreading dragon rot to your loved ones.
Number 6, Headless. For this list, we'll be talking about the headless encountered in the Sunken Valley Mist. For the footage that you are seeing, I battled this particular headless after killing the Mist Noble because I had skipped him by accident. This headless takes the lead over the other land-based headless because his battle arena is less user-friendly than the others. To prepare for this fight, I recommend the same loadout as you had for the Shishiman Warrior and come equipped with the Mottled Purple Gourd, Phoenix's Lilac Umbrella, and Divine Confetti. Headless is a pain in the ass due to his passive ability that emits an aura of dread that minimizes your movement and mobility, effectively rendering you unable to run or dodge. Hitting Headless with confetti imbued attacks will reduce the strength and range of his aura, but unlike the Shishiman Warrior, Headless will not stagger much from your attacks. Up close, he will attack you with long winded, dramatic sword swings that are so delayed that you'll end up blocking early a majority of the time. Failing to perfect block Headless's attacks will result in terror status buildup. He has two deadly attacks that you need to be on the lookout for. The first is his perilous attack, which comes in the form of a grapple. To avoid this, you need to get away from him, and fast. This will prove to be difficult as he capitalizes on the hindrance of his passive to pull this move off. The other attack you need to watch out for is his 360 sweep. For this move, Headless will swing the sword high above his head before bringing it around for a night on the town. This attack needs to be deflected or dodged because even if blocked, this attack deals massive terror damage which can easily end up killing you. If you choose to space yourself from him to heal, Headless will go with one of two options. He will vanish and reappear behind you, usually leading with the grapple attack. You shouldn't be in any real danger from this, seeing as how this pattern of behavior is easily predicted. Also note that he uses this attack as a revenge value if you get too oppressive. For his second option, he may opt to send out small terror missiles that home in on your position. These are similar to the illusion projectiles that Lady Butterfly uses in her second phase and should be dodged as such. If you have it, the Lilac Umbrella can be deployed to provide cover against this. The key to this boss is perfect blocks and generous usage of the purple gourd. Stay topped on confetti and hope for the best. Luckily, Headless has zero points in defense and as such he will not block any of your incoming attacks. Unfortunately, that's all the good news that there is for this boss. The Sunken Valley Headless specifically takes the spot over his other iterations not only because his power is scaled decently, but primarily because his arena is ass putty. Trying to fight him here is like trying to push a Lincoln log through your large intestine. It ain't easy! I almost put the two headless underwater fight on this list instead, but quite frankly I had an easier time dealing with the double headless fight because of the ease that comes with hit and run tactics. In addition to this, you have end game loadout and the water headless fights don't have a slowing aura. Number 5, Snake Eyes Shirafuji. This fight is simply a more fair fight against Snake Eyes Shirahagi. This is because Shirafuji is found facing at you directly, which means you're going to have to face her head on. She builds the same moveset as her counterpart with no noticeable changes in aggression. The battle gun is less than ideal, which unfortunately puts you in a close quarters brawl. Like before, the snake eyes deal significant posture damage with each attack, so your best bet is to perfect dodge her gunshots before cutting into her guard during the downtime. As always, be on the lookout for the exaggerated perilous grapple attack, as this has the strangest of hitboxes and deals significant damage. Stay away from the right side of the mountain as there are many Snake Eyes soldiers off in the distance who will be taking paw shots at you should you go within their line of sight. Avoid getting cornered by Shirafuji as she can be relentless in her attacks. You'll want to find the sweet spot in spacing in order to bait out her gunshots so you can get some free damage in without jeopardizing your posture and vitality. As always, you can expect to die a few times to get it right, but eventually, you'll pull through. Number 4, Seven Ashina Spears, Shikibu Toshikatsu Yamachi. <sighs> now we're getting into the cream filling of the shit souffle. I hate to admit it, but Shikibu Yamachi is the only mini boss in this entire list that I deliberately cheesed. But hopefully, when I talk about him, you'll understand why. The Seven Ashina Spears is far too juiced for when you encounter him. Each attack of his deals a minimum of 40%, but most of his attacks hit for the 80% range. And when I say 80% damage, I mean 80% to both your vitality and your posture. This means that it takes only two attacks to either shatter your guard or straight up kill you. The range of his attacks is something out of Space Jam, as his spear seems to extend like he's exploding cartoon physics. To make matters worse, the area you fight him in is not ideal by any stretch of the definition. Initially, I attempted to use the low ground power boost against him, but therein lies the problem that there are two big ass Terra warriors and several soldiers that you risk alerting if you retreat too far. The Terros and gunmen also have high perception, so you don't even need to go that far to gain their interest in the first place. This restricts your already inconvenient battleground to the small patch at the top. 
I was terrible at Makiri countering at this stage of the game, so you can imagine the fuckbuckery that was bestowed upon me. This fight was made increasingly infuriating because just getting back to him was such a pain in the ass. Each time you have to run through the soldier mobs and then hide until you lost all of them, wherein sometimes it would take up to 3 minutes for them to lose interest in you. And then, when you finally get the stealth blow, you would just get blown away in 4 seconds, therefore having to repeat the whole process again. Rematching this boss got so time consuming that I opted for the patented codiferous tier 2 low ground cheese. To beat this boss, simply bait him onto the stairs, after securing your death blow of course. He will get caught on the stairs and try to attack you from the high ground. Stick close to the side of the stairs and hit him with jump attacks. Wait until he attacks first because he is still able to hit you in the air if you're sloppy. This will take a long time. But hey, slow and steady wins the race. And in this case, cutting him up one toe at a time says that this is the freest prayer bead of your whole damn life. Fuck this boss. Number 3, Shigekichi of the Red Guard. Shigekichi is a sumo warrior mini boss with two added twists. The first difference you'll notice is that he's surrounded by a US standard ass ton of ads, and they're not the basic ones either. They're the new endgame Crimson Soldiers, and they are by no means in short demand. Secondly, you'll soon discover that Shigekichi specializes in fire as opposed to poison like Juzuo and Tokajiro. Just to attempt this fight, you need to assassinate each of the many soldiers which can take a very long time to do. When you finally get to fighting Shigekichi, prepare to dig your heels in, because this bad boy hits like a jumbo jet. This boss made me realize that when it comes to Sekiro, the health system in this game might as well be likened to Hollow Knight, except you only get two mask emblems. Just look at this. Nine prayer necklaces, and homie doesn't give a single fuck about me. Jews will dealt 60-80% to vitality damage when I had no necklaces. Shigekichi deals 60-80% to vitality when I have nine prayer necklaces. What? As far as his actual moveset, Shigekichi boasts the same loadout as the previous sumo warriors, but has increased aggression. It's also a pain in the ass that he imbues his weapon with fire, because even deflecting his attacks will still stack up the burn status. And in case you forgot, being burned stops your posture from regenerating in addition to dealing damage over time. You are able to deflect his sword swings, but even through that he will max out your posture in no time at all. I recommend using the Mist Raven prosthetic as it allows you to relocate after each of his lumbering attacks and slice into his spots of vulnerability. His most dangerous moves are his grapple and his fire blast attack. His grapple will almost one shot you if you're at anything less than full health. The key to avoiding this is to either escape its long range or have frame perfect dodging. His fire blast on the other hand will deal significant damage in addition to applying full burn. The range on this attack is impressive so be ready to back away further than you think you need to. You'll always know when he's going to do this attack because Shigekichi will take a generous swig from his flask beforehand. I barely skeeted out the win on my first real one-on-one -on -one fight against him, so unfortunately I don't have an extensive data set to share. But believe you me, my one try against him is enough to earn him this spot. You have to keep in mind that he has fought at endgame, after I have every available upgrade as well as decent mastery over the mechanics of the game, and he still gave me a run for my money. Number 2, 7 Ashina Spears, Shume Masaji Oniwa. It only makes sense that the harder of the two Ashina Spears finds his way at the top. Shume Oniwa is a downright pain in the ass for all the right reasons. He's a leveled up variant of Shikibu Yomachi, meaning that his attacks still deal exorbitant amounts of damage. To make matters worse, you don't get a free stealth blow because he's accompanied by a single health bar Samurai General. This Samurai General hype guy is skilled to having the same abilities and damage in the likeness of Kuronosuke Matsumoto. This means that you are essentially fighting two mini-bosses simultaneously. Now I discovered later that there exists a strategy to make this fight much easier, but I wasn't privy to that information, so I took these boys head on. And holy hell was it hard. Unlike the Guardian Ape Headless Ape boss fight, these two actually managed to synchronize their periods and attack you at the same time. I chose to focus on knocking out the Samurai General first by luring him to the low ground and then unleashing the Mortal Draw for some solid damage. Please note that you risk being knocked into the flames here, which happened to me more times than I bear to recount. After dispatching the Samurai General, you now have the pleasure of fighting the Ashina Spear in a 1v1. 
Mercury Counter is going to be your best friend here as he loves his long range thrusts. There's a generous window to counter him for each thrust, but unfortunately when you get the counter, he always throws you off a spear, knocking you back. Seeing as how you have a cliff to one side and fire on another, be mindful of your displacement, because it could end up costing you like it did me. <sighs> Not my proudest moment. The mortal draws an incredibly powerful combat art, so if you see a window to use it and have the emblems to spare, take the shot. I also recommend using the long spark firecrackers to get yourself some spacing from this relentless duo. You're going to be in for a tough fight, so expect those deaths to come forward in steady supply. If you're looking to handicap this boss fight, I am told that you can jump to the tree branch to lure the samurai general into falling off the edge. You can then run away and hide to promptly come back and stealth blow Shumei. You're welcome. I know I normally talk about specific boss attacks to be on the lookout for, so for this boss, you're going to need to be on the lookout for all of them. Number 1, Lone Shadow Masanaga the Spear Bearer. Unlike Shume Onewa who was a pain in the ass for all the right reasons, Masanaga is a pain in the taint for all the wrong reasons. When it comes to difficult boss fights, I'm normally good at keeping my cool if deaths come from a deficiency with my skill level or my struggling of game mechanics. I have a huge problem with boss fights when my death comes from twat scotch bullshittery. Masanaga is battled at two separate instances, but for this list, he takes the number one spot for his fight in Owl's memory. Because he instantly aggros to you, there's no opportunity to get a stealth blow on him, which means you're going to have to square up the old fashioned way. Masanaga is the COVID version of Violent Hand. With relentless attacks and boosted damage, he wants one thing and one thing only, and that's exclusive rights to claiming your cheekies. This boss takes the top spot because in addition to being a mini boss variant of one of the toughest enemy types in the game, he comes loaded with four bullshit factors. His first BSF involves him summoning three white wolves at any available instance that you are not in his face. This means that when you back off to use your gourd, he will take advantage of this and summon some adds to punish you for healing. Even though they're just wolves, they still deal a moderate amount of damage with their attacks and can stagger you enough while Masanaga comes in for the kill. There is also no end to the amount of times that he can call wolves, so don't think that there exists a reality where you can exhaust his puppy supply. On the topic of punishing you for spacing, Masanaga also has the ability to regain his posture in the same way that the Samurai Generals can. For both his Wolf Whistle and Posture Restore ability, I recommend taking the Shuriken Prosthetic because throwing one will interrupt both of these abilities. The next BSF comes from the arena itself. It's surrounded by fire, which can become a real problem for you if you accidentally get cornered at the wrong side of town. Naturally, the boss appears immune to the environmental hazard, but if you step in it, you light up like a pile of dry leaves. The final BSF comes from the mob of enemies located to the left of the arena. If you get too close, you'll attract their attention and be left with a fuster cluck of taro soldiers and flame archers. All of these BSFs force you to be aggressive versus Masanaga, which is a very daunting task. He has the same loadout as Lone Shadow Vilehand, so be prepared for poison attacks and a lot of kicking. As before, your biggest opportunities for posture damage come from jump kicking his sweeping kick and Mercury countering the last attack in his kick combo. Pay close attention to your posture meter, because the last thing you want is to get broken in the middle of one of these combos, as he has the potential to 100% you if you make a mistake. The attack that caused me the most trouble was his roundhouse kick that he does about 50% of the time at the end of one of his regular combos. I could never tell when he was going to do the attack, and I always got hit by it, as I figured that it would be my turn to attack, when in actuality, I don't get a turn to attack. As with Shigekichi, I barely squeaked out the victory versus this mini boss. so if you had an easier time than I did, then more power to you. Well, that's going to do it for this list. Thank you so much for sticking through this lengthy rambling of semi-redundant boss fights. I hope you guys enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed suffering to make it. Hopefully I'll see you for the next one, so until then, take care, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you then. Bye bye